Hello everyone. This is an update in regards to my ongoing series for my hypothesis of QNT and how I feel as though it will be the most expensive token in history. Yes, token, not coin. I own that coin that you guys always refer to and I cover it on this channel quite often. But for the purposes of this outline, let's get more into this particular research. And that is just like you saw in the thumbnail, quant. Will it truly be or already is the Google for BlackRock? Now we know when it comes to Google, Google is the world's most used and most popular indexing protocol out there. So think about what I just mentioned. Will QNT, or is it currently speaking, the indexing platform for the likes of something like BlackRock? Well, I'll give you this much of a tidbit. And that is, when we talk about tokenization, what do we really have? Do we have examples of an index investing engine? That's the clue I'm going to give you moving forward, because I'm not going to spill all the beans. You're going to have to be willing to stick around, hopefully, to the end of the outline and consider smash not like before we move forward. Because while I realize that quite a few people will only stick around for about 5 or 15 minutes, there's a lot of people that want to understand the fundamentals moving forward and the connections that quant has to some of these big institutions so i get it and i do appreciate everybody who listens to the material whether you only have a little bit of time or you have a lot of time there is chapters slash timestamps in the description of this video for whatever audience is viewing i do appreciate you all as we get into the outline Shout out to the one and only Quant Papa for providing some of this detailed research as well as other researchers. I also, of course, have my own research. But we're going to first jump into the topic of staking before we get into all this. Because actually speaking, with my research, you're going to hear about how we even tie in the likes of staking to the whole big picture of this outline. Jumping into the first thing that I have, let's take you over to the screenshot that the one and only Quant Papa has for us. And it basically is this. We're gonna start off here. And why am I doing that? Because I want you guys to understand that when you see statements like this, it's Quant's goal to continue basically sticking to their guns that dates back all the way to 2018. This statement from Telegram from the one and only Gilbert Verdian. He says, hi, Brian. Thank you for the good question. I understand your points. We are creating an internet scale ecosystem that is geared to benefit developers and enterprise, but more importantly, to investors. Our business model drives growth to the platform, which drives the demand and the need for the tokens. Again, emphasis on the need for the tokens. This is part of the product strategy targeted to developers and enterprises, as well as our consulting approach to help enterprise to use the platform. The more customers, maps, which is referred to as multi-apps, and users on the platform, the more demand for the token to access the platform and published maps with the token. Paolo Tasca also has a statement. And if you're new to all this, he was part of Hedera, and he's also part of Quant. So simply, Q&T token value will depend to the size of the market for multi-apps. As Q&T is fixed, pre-mined supply, bigger the demand for maps, multi-apps, higher the value for Q&T. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we saw some price action in reference to some of this stuff. So jump into the next part. Gilbert Verdian, straight from Telegram from a while back. Thank you, Robin, Charno, and Big Muzzy. We have never deviated from our 2018 approach. Quant Papa's take on all this. Shout out to him. Maybe he doesn't want me telling on him. Hopefully I don't get in trouble with him. But I thought this would make sense for you guys. So a little bit of the translation is not perfect. I'll do my best to provide it to you guys. He says, quant added staking, at least this is you know, his post from mid-August, 
But Quant added staking, and there are terms of service, but in his opinion, and he's not the only one that feels this way, if Q&T staking pays people in Q&T tokens, they, or maybe even him, will sell their bag. Now, that sounds like FUD, does it not? But he mentions if Quant staking was to pay in U.S. dollars or euros or maybe other things like British pounds, then it's an absolute green light. The Q&T stakers get paid in quant. It's a massive red flag because what will happen, in his opinion, and again, this is his own opinion, but he's a great researcher. It will bleed the price to death. I do want to hear your thoughts in regards to that. On top of that, he says, for everybody, Gilbert clearly stated long ago that gateway operators slash stakers will not be paid in Q&T. And there it is from the citation from the one and only Gilbert Verdian. You don't get paid in QNT. We are a utility token, not a security. We've been clear about this. Just like if you go to the Quant Network site, if you guys remember the last particular deep dive, we point out that QNT in itself, you could be a guy that's like gung ho exchange. Hey, I would like to list QNT on my exchange. And what's the response from the quant network? They could literally care less because they don't look at quant as being a cryptocurrency. Now, to you, me, and everybody else, it sure the heck seems like it is, but is that really the point? No, it's not. It's understanding that it's the clarification of some of these things, which brings me to this particular topic. And shout out to Greg Lunt, great researcher who brings in a lot of info. And I've seen that you guys have probably watched this on Nick's channel, NCAST. Shout out to him, great researcher. But more importantly, we're not the only ones talking about some of these things. So I will show you some of this, but it's also elaborating a little bit more in regards to even some of my research. Let's take you over to this for a second. Here we go. Greg Lunt states breaking, not too breaking. I mean, you know, it's posted a while, but there was an update on September 7th that he had that says Q&T CEO Gilbert Verdian just appeared on Telegram. And more importantly, if you're not aware of this, it was for the first time in two years. And it wasn't just to say hi. Gray mentions, we now have confirmation that Quant has received regulatory and legal clarity around staking and other forms of rewards. Now, don't get tunnel vision on this. And I say this with no offense to anybody. But sometimes when you see the statements of regulatory and legal clarity and then immediately followed up with staking and other forms of rewards, you miss the original point. And that is this. This statement of regulatory and legal clarity, that, in my opinion, everybody, is the hint it's a little crumb of seeing how q and t will take off and i'm going to show you a reference of what i am talking about with that because guess what when he came out with the update in regards to this which was posted on the 7th something happened and let me show you about what i'm talking about because basically speaking we all have seen examples of buy the rumor sell the news but when i tell you and i'm not the only one telling you guys this when I'm telling you flat out, how many times have we been yearning for examples of getting regulatory clarity to see these assets absolutely skyrocket in value? Well, this is a crumb or a taste of things to come. How so? For one, this news broke out roughly on his update, you know, September 6th, give or take. And, of course, he had the update on September 7th. If this is not buy the rumor, sell the news, you tell me what is. Or how about this? If this isn't a taste of regulatory clarity, just a smidge, you tell me what is. Because I'm going to show you a reference in that regard. And, again, this is just from CMC. There's other outlets that we could use. So the bottom. How many of you guys bought the bottom? I know I did. Just a few. But guess what? I was glad. And a lot of you guys were glad as well on your payday to at least buy a little bit more QNT because guess what? You probably bought around $55, $56, hopefully. But look at that. September 6th, that was my dad's birthday, his 90th birthday. God bless him. I love him and miss him every day. But guess what? Right after this, you see an absolute surge of QNT and finally some good news for a change. Well, good news as far as people complaining about the price of QNT. But bad news in regards to those that just want to continue to buy at 55 who see the bigger picture. The point is this, everybody. 
if this is just a small taste of things to come, can you imagine when we get full regulatory clarity? That's the point I'm trying to share with you guys. That's what I want to get more into the weeds about. And if anything, what other examples do we have in regards to this? Well, I don't want to dismiss some of this that was shared from Greg, but the point is some of you guys are going to take advantage of the whole thing of what you consider passive income. But like he says, let him repeat staking on over ledger was just confirmed by Gilbert Verdian. Now I don't have the whole thing on how to do it because from what I've seen, there is no thing about how to do it. This is just something that they recently talked about and it's understanding where we go from here. But to see GV once again, coming out of the woodwork on telegram, that's pretty cool. What's the statement he makes? Well, it's, he goes into detail of stating quote, we kept working on the ideas in the background, but so far now, after getting regulatory and legal clarity, we'll be introducing different forms of stake and rewards to encourage even more participation on the Overledger platform and ecosystem. Again, growing out the ecosystem. I mean, they have gotten criticism from quite a few people, but from a retail perspective of that ecosystem, some people say, well, the only thing that was ever built on Quant from a retail perspective, is Leo X. That's actually a bad representation of that. I mean, Quant's focus is what the, you know, in regards to in, what the institutions are going to do. So I like that because, you know, that's where the smart money is. That's where the big money is. So going forward, he says here, Overledger platform ecosystem. Some of you noticed changes to the terms and conditions recently. You're more than welcome to read more about that if that's your thing. But I thought I would point this out, and I thought it was a good research that Greg basically shared. A little bit more about this as we go further down. This is, of course, from the update of September 7th, and it basically states here that services may include QT staking, customers shall be responsible. Again, you can go to the Quant Network site. Um, and then it goes on to also mention a QT means those utility tokens which customers may use for Quant products and services, including staking it being understood that they may also be used for products or services separately to the agreement. And more importantly, also understand that Quant, because they got to protect themselves, will not be liable for any losses or liabilities incurred by the customer for any user error or behalf of the customer or any authorized user in respect of staking activities. Again, back to that statement that you mentioned in regards to, you know, not really even caring if it's listed on, you know, exchanges or somebody's news, like, yeah, I got a new exchange. I want to use, you know, list QT. Like, they really feel as though, hey, there's enough exchanges and there's a very limited supply of 14.88 million tokens. That's the max supply, right? That, that whole supply is not even in circulation, it's like roughly 80% or more, right? So you can look more into this if you choose to do so. And again, back to this, because on a seven day chart, quant is up. 16.65%. And that is significant when it comes to quant because even if it was 5%, I mean, that's a big difference. I mean, going from $55 a token to 71, that is a big deal for QNT. All right. Now, here's the thing I want us all to mainly have focus on other than just talking about staking and stuff. So while there was a lot of news about the staking and that type of focus, I mean, that's fine. But I also want you guys to understand it's what really counts in my book, and that is back to the statements of regulatory clarity, okay? So Gilbert Verdian mentions another call to action. He says that the UK needs a new regulator to stake its claim as a leader in the age of digital finance. No, I didn't pull this up because it just said stake, but I mean, you know, call it a coincidence. But like he says, it's a punchy headline, and he knows... Like, it sounds to be amazing with a headline like that. Maybe call it clickbait, whatever you want. But the idea that he has thought about for a while is the whole thing of, you know, finally putting pen and paper in his latest article for Ledger Insights. And that is, he states that he feels as though they're almost there when it comes to, like, three uk asset managers that will offer tokenized funds for the next five years think about this and i'll connect it even to the likes of blackrock but making the most of this opportunity requires highly specialized skills and expertise but the current regulatory setup is holding back the pace of progress in the same way that the u.s government backed the internet engineering task force which is the ietf 
of the 80s and 90s, the UK must create a digital asset specific regulator to truly modernize our payment landscape and provide regulatory clarity for adoption of digital assets. Again, understanding it's not necessarily the news about, you know, to us in retail about, you know, hey, guess what? Retail Q and T holders, you can stake Q and T. It's it's more like, guess what? There actually is a path forward for regulatory clarity. So he has an article that discusses some of this. I want to just get into a brief bit of why this is important because it took me over to here, and he goes into this detail from you know Ledger Insights, like you're talking about, because he goes on to mention that for the UK, they definitely lack like a body, okay? They don't lack the, the whole idea of innovation or technology, but they lack a regulatory body to drive the whole thing forward. So he says for tokenization, to put London back at the forefront of financial innovation, we need a separate regulatory body. And he came up with a working name. It's called Digital Finance Agency dedicated entirely to digital assets. Now, you guys know me for the most part, if you've been following me for a while, I dig deep into this stuff when I see statements like that. So, you know, anybody's able to do a basic search. So I'm going to share just a little bit of what I searched. So I jumped into it and I was like, all right, well, digital finance agency, that kind of caught my attention because, you know, the real path forward for these assets getting sent, especially the blue ships is regulatory clarity. So when you do a search twice, this comes up and the first search result is us agency for international development which is called digital finance and i'm thinking to myself okay well you know that's just google recommended it doesn't mean necessarily that that's what i'm looking for but then it pops up again basically and then it brings me to other things especially the linkedin one and i thought huh that might be what i'm looking for because as I got into that, I think it is because it says we are a team of true PR professionals in fintech and blockchain field under the terms of subscription service. And think about that, everybody. Subscription service. Quant with the Overledger has a subscription service. So that opened up my, or raised my eyebrows a little bit. Decided to jump into that. As I went over there, I said to myself, well, hmm, if I'm doing an outline, I need to provide a little bit more information to my audience and pound at home a little bit more about Gilbert Verdian's background. Because we did mention the whole thing of, you know, it's, is there any tie whatsoever to like the United States? Well, the answer is yes. If you go to gilbertverdian.com.cv, you see his robust resume. And just to re-remind you, if you're new, Federal Reserve, Fed Payments Improvement Community, he's still on that. April 2018 to present. Yeah, United States Federal Reserve System. And you will see a video at the end of this video outline that will share my hypothesis of how I feel as though that Gilbert Verdian is definitely the culprit of like the, the guy that came up with Fed now, basically. Seriously, I full heartedly believe that. And, you know, I feel as though I provide enough evidence to support that hypothesis. Getting more into it. What's also interesting, just in case you didn't know, he was part of the Federal Reserve Secure Payments Task Force from March 2017, of course, to July 2018. So, again, a re-reminder. But here's where it gets really, really good. If you were to go over to this particular LinkedIn publication, you will see that digital finance community is listed. And more importantly, it's understanding that when you get there, it talks about many, or I should say, among their customers, it's banks, payment aggregators, IPSP, which I'll go into a little bit of detail here in a little bit, payment systems, blockchain platforms, fintech startups. But in order to view their cases, there's a detailed presentation of the services. And what's really weird is, you know, you get a detailed plan for PR for half a year period and, you know, depends on your budget. But again, about the overledger in itself, like overledger actually depends on certain people's budget right? Enterprise level, light startup. So I thought that was interesting. And maybe I'm completely wrong. But again, I'm just trying to pro provide research about this, connect some dots. So I went over to the USAID.gov. And instead of looking at it as being USAID, I thought to myself, I wonder if it actually is more like USAID. And some people are going to think that's a stretch, but think about it. Don't get twisted. Gilbert Verdian went over to Europe to pitch 
things like the you know the the year ID right for Europe, and then what we also saw over in Japan, you had the whole thing of my number, right? My number cards. I covered Jasmine quite a bit, but again, my number ID as Japan, and then the whole thing of you know the Euro ID system. So that's the thing. So maybe that's a coincidence. I don't know, but nonetheless, I jump more into it because. As you go here, they talk about harnessing technology and potential for a better world. And let's face it, everybody, a lot of people feel as though still to this day that the United States of America has never embraced this technology for Web3 moving forward. But as we unravel some of this with detailed research, it seems as though that they've been in the background all along. How so? And more importantly, does this have any tie to quant whatsoever? Don't know that. But I could put two and two together, and I could try to connect it with some detailed research and read, just like you guys are following along as we speak. So it goes on to mention that USAID, USAID is the world's premier international development agency and a, uh, a catalytic actor driving development results. But it's the advancement of U.S. national security and economic prosperity. My goodness. You know, and... Again, recent articles posted here as of September 10th. So this is very up to date. What is this all about? Is it just truly USAID? Because when you see those tech, um, excuse me, statements posted here, I think that's worth pointing out. Excuse me. I'm going to jump into the next part. Part right of the screen. Draw your attention there. They have a pamphlet, if you will. USAID or USAID, whatever you want to call it, digital policy. But it says 2024, 2034. This is really interesting. And it says development in a digital age. I mean, I don't think a lot of people are talking about this on a lot of different channels, no knock on them. But it's policy. And again, back to Gilbert Verdian's reference, because sometimes you just got to go down the rabbit hole. So USAID. Digital policy provides the vision of the agency to work towards a future where digital technology promotes inclusive growth. Think about all this, everybody. Fosters resilient and democratic societies, advances in human rights, but it's the empowerment for everyone. A little bit more about their policy. They talk about embracing democratic values, talking about the whole thing of, you know, countering authoritarianism. But again, back to the whole thing of what? digital technologies so this is interesting to see this in 2024 and if anything how that policy reaches out to 2034 do they have something that we don't know about seems as though i don't think for the most part everybody knows about this but when you get down to some of the key areas well remember how gilbert verdian is talking about an ecosystem well it says understanding the digital ecosystem and they talk about how it's time to invest or I should say, yeah, invest time to understand local talk, uh, contexts. It will help prevent unintended programmatic consequences. And it gets more into the whole thing about infrastructure and local digital capacity. So all of this stuff, to me, seems as though it adds up. But more importantly, is this all we have? Well, the answer is no. Because if you were to download this PDF, it's in reference to something that existed for quite a while. From 2017 to 2020, and if anything, they have updates. It's about a U.S. global development lab, and more importantly, digital finance. But it all adds up to blockchain, DLT, because like it says, inclusive electronic payments such as mobile money not only have the potential to lift millions out of poverty, but could also improve governance by reducing costs, increase transparency. And some of these statements, when I get more into the weeds of it, kind of remind me of Augustine Karsten's and his idea of the finternet. And I know some of you guys maybe get tired of hearing that, but get used to it because it's a real thing. But where did it really all start? And more importantly, is understanding, like, how would you develop an ecosystem out of this? So even on the illustration, to me, it's like, yep, this kind of seems like what he was talking about, the finternet. You have to have regulators. You have to have inclusion. You have to have the whole idea of safe service providers. And if anything, who would be those distribution of networks? 
Who would be the integrated systems? Who would it actually be the uh, you know the customers? Because when you see statements of you had to find electronic electronic money and compel those to have a, a affordable alternative to cash, well, as we know, Bitcoin is truly the peer to peer cash. You know what was it called? Peer to peer cash system, right? But is Quant with the Overledger a peer to peer financial system? So sometimes when we see all this stuff it looks interesting but for me personally i always do this i always try to see what's in the fine print and here's where some of the aha moments came because for one there's a citation about better than cash plug into mobile money platforms i said to myself how do you say like the finternet without saying finternet or how do you say quant without saying quant shout out to the one and only mr shenny harrell Go follow him on his channel. Even though he hasn't made content in a while, that's okay. Follow him on his channel. Great content creator. But MIT.edu, Jack Surrey, what is that? That caught my attention because we know that MIT, how many times do we see them working with Quant? Well, numerous times, right? So I thought I'd go over there and all sorts of things kind of open up. For one, this lady. She is Tavneet Suri. She is the professor of applied economics and a professor of applied economics at MIT Sloan School of Management. More importantly, she has expertise in the role of technology for sub-Saharan Africa. And that's interesting because she has done a ton of featured research, whether it comes to universal basic income in Kenya or, for example, credit access for you know, asset collateralized loans, evidence from Kenya. I mean, think about it. It's not just her opinion. It's more like providing actual factual evidence. And goes on to more info about this. FinTech, evidence of digital loans in Kenya. But again, three citations here. And two of the three really caught my attention because I was like, huh, I decided to read these. And guess what? It added up back to what Augustine Carsons was talking about with the Finternet. And I'll take you to the citation because guess what? In this paper from nber.org, it goes into some detail. And one of the things they get into is this working paper. It's a series, kind of like I'm doing a series with you guys, of the inclusion and democratization through Web3 and DeFi, initial evidence from the Ethereum ecosystem. And this was published February 2023. But it was an ongoing series, and when you see her citation, and this is, I believe, you know, it's an APA format. I used to actually teach us at college back in the day. But anyway, um, you see this lady literally being mentioned here, along with Jack Williams, or Williams, William Jack, I should say. Actually, Jack Williams, sorry, and to Tavni Suri. She wrote, they wrote this back in 2014 of what? Risk sharing and transaction costs, evidence from Kenya's mobile money revolution, American Economic Review, which brings me over to here. And while I don't have the full book, because I'm not going to purchase a book just, you know, for one quick outline, I might get this later. But it's understanding that there's at least this abstract. It's from the American Economic Association. This is good. I mean, you know, some people are, are clearly gone by now. But for all you guys that are the hardcore blockchain enthusiasts that want to truly know the connections to what you have and why you hold it, shout out to you for listening. So risk sharing, transaction costs, as you can see in the abstract, they explore the impact of reduced transaction costs on risk sharing by estimating the effects of mobile money innovation on consumption. That also adds up to Augustine Karsten's pitch. A while back and i'll show you the evidence it says in their panel sample adoption and innovation increased from 43 to 70 percent you may be wondering why i'm sharing this with you i want you to understand the explosive growth of things that dated back from 2014 to present it says we find that while shocks reduce consumption by seven percent for non-users the consumption of households is unaffected the mechanism underlying these consumption effects increases in remittances as we know Quant's old name before their quant was called Remit. Look what also says diversity of senders. We report robustness checks of these results 
the fourfold expansion of Mobile Money Agent Network is a source of exogenous variation. For not pronouncing right, I've listened to this term. It basically just means growth, you know, if you're going to be technical. But variation and access to the innovation. Sometimes I read too much and sometimes I just mess up a word once in a while. I'm human. I'm not AI. But anyway, the point is, when I got more into this, this added up with what Augustine Carsons was talking about. Because check this out. Remember I talked about IS or IPSP? Well, previous slide says what? International Panel of Social Progress. And as I got more into it, look at these key highlights. The International Panel on Social Progress mobilizes a group of several hundred academics, entrepreneurs, associative activists, government officials, philanthropists. You see this picture, IPSP, Lisbon 2017, and they had a call to action. And guess who had a call to action in Lisbon, Portugal, just a few months ago of a call to action? Yeah, that's right. Gilbert Verdi is saying that your time is running out either you know what, or get off the pot, basically, because there's going to be a radical shift, especially after regulations come. So I thought that was interesting, especially in Lisbon. Some people may call it coincidence, but you got to keep in mind, 2014 to 2019, they laid down the foundations for what they call a better society. But more importantly, when you get more into it, it links it all back to the whole thing of what Augustine Carstens was talking about, and that was mobilizing collective intelligence for action. The panel obviously renewed itself and as i got more into this in itself i was blown away to see even in some of the recent updates july 10 2024 because it mentions specifically that you know it's like who's tied to this like federal governments banks you name it but it's the new infrastructure okay and it talks about this right here uh global crises let me go back because it got so many different um interpretations but yeah, it mentions like some of the global crises and, you know, past, present, and future. But, you know, you need the balance of governance with popular. Let me just click on the darn thing for it doesn't switch anymore. I'm so sorry. It talks about, you know, how some of this was popularized for legitimacy. So let me take you over to this for a second. And it goes on to mention that specifically they had to rethink how they're going to go about this new society. But again, this guy, Mr. Shane, argues for balanced governance and also having the whole thing of examining recent U.S. midterm elections, at least then, and the global leadership. Like, who was going to, you know, embrace some of this, right? And again, this is July 10th. So, hmm, interesting. As I got more into this, it says, why a panel on social progress? Well, it says specifically that they recognize that you had scholars who met back even in 2015 to have what they call an independent bottom-up initiative and more importantly understanding that you know you have to examine policy issues for not just like short term but medium term and also have a structure for systematic or systemic excuse me issues for the long term but bottom line is mobilizing a uniquely wide set of perspectives with real solutions. Look at this. Change makers, society, namely the many leaders and citizens who act in their organizations or communities at all levels to contribute to the advancement of social progress. And it's just like, there's got to be more to it. So anyway, I know that's quite a bit to share. But then it jumped to here. And it actually jumped back to the connection with, you know, the citation of Gilbert Verdian, because he mentioned EY on that particular report when he was writing up for the, uh, excuse me, the Ledger Insights article. So look at this, guys. This gets good. 63% of institutional and 59% of HNW investors rank private equity as the first or second tokenized alternative of interest with real estate a close second. There's this other one, 80% of HNW investors and 77% of institutional investors want distributed, or I should say distribution of tokenized assets through traditional financial institutions. I mean, think about it. Overledger does all that. They recognize the traditional models. Hence why you have that bridge to fiat, not just abandoning it and so on, but again, understanding that 
you have to have that trust. Otherwise, no one's going to use your utility. So this is another good one. 45% of HNW investors said they'd be willing to pay higher fees to access direct real estate equity. But more importantly, 57% of institutionals expect lower fees on tokenized assets versus comparably, you know, the comparable traditionally issued assets. And this last part, 63% would consider investing in tokenized real estate investments without voting power if it meant lower investment minimums. Think about supply and demand forces kicking in for quant when it has an all-in-one solution for that. More importantly, how so? Well, you have to give somebody what they refer to as one-way traffic. And what I mean by that is this citation from FNLondon.com because here is where we break into some of the things even with BlackRock. Asset managers have been piling into private markets, and it's an area that BlackRock, yeah, you read that right, estimates could reach $40 trillion in assets by 2030. Currently, the private market's data alone is worth around $8 billion, but it's, of course, looking to scale tremendously. So $40 trillion in assets by 2030? Remember that for a moment because we're going to wrap it up towards the end and reference that. So I said to myself, I heard years ago that Augustine Carsons was part of the IMF. And guess what? If you go to IMF.org, that actually was true. But I thought to myself, if I'm going to talk about the Finternet, where do we get the citation about how it all started? I honestly think this is where it's at. I think he pitched this long before blockchain was even a thing. Look at this. Improving the policy, the response to financial crisis, remarks by Augustine Carsons, Back in June 14th, 2004, because at that time, he's the deputy managing director, not of the Bank of International Settlements, but the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And look what it says. It goes on to mention specifically about how he recognizes, you know, the 60th anniversary, at least then, of Bretton Woods. Like right now would be the 80th anniversary, Right. But it's the close collaboration with the IMF putting it all together. Again, this didn't happen to the scale that he wanted it to happen. His second chance of doing this is through quant, through the overledger. And we've had numerous citations and references to this. But more importantly, when he talks about like the mobility side of things, this gets good. Because this adds up. And how does it do it? Because he states that you have to have a balance sheet. Look at this. This is really, really good. Interlinking cross sectors of this economy that can amplify weaknesses in individual sectors and propagate crisis across sectors to the balance of payments. Oh, my God. You know, it, it's kind of like the Great Reset didn't happen then. But he recognized years ago, 20 years ago, he... You know, and a lot of people say this conspiracy stuff, but if you really look into it, I mean, my friend, shout out to my buddy, Mike Wool, one of my best friends. He pointed out in like the year 2000, 2001, he was talking about central banks before everybody else was talking about it. And I used to think, I was like, man, I love you, bro, uh, bro but, you know, it, it, it just sounds like left field. And it, that aged well. So that statement from 2004 about all this, it's like you can see where this was like this was inceptionalized years before the concept of a bitcoin white paper interlinkages um complicate you know policy response to magnify the cost of a crisis resolution look at this there is also uncertain regarding the effectiveness of policy which depends critically on the perceived credibility of the corrective measures when the reputation of the authorities tends to be at its lowest level there is uncertainty regarding the political support for reforms. Policymakers face the additional challenge of quickly mobilizing public support for unpopular measures. It's like a call to action even then. And then he goes on to also mention that policymakers may need to factor in potential costs for domestic financial system if bank portfolios are significantly exposed to government debt. I mean, people will say, well, boom, XRP. But guess what? Quant's also part of that mix because why? ISO TC-307, it's the orchestration. It will complement the living heck out of ISO 222. And as we know, I mean, those are the ones that we hold, and I cover them quite often. XRP, Stellar, HBAR. I mean, shoot, there's some other ones, right? 
It's understanding the bigger picture of that. So you can read more about this. I would highly encourage you to go to imf.org. You can look up this particular article. The headline is basically improving the policy response and just look up the citation from Augustine Carstens. If you're really into this stuff, you might want to read the whole thing. Jumping a little bit more about this, did Quant ever citate anything at all about the IMF? Well, on their site, at least, only once. And that is basically speaking, it, it might actually might be more than once. It might say International Monetary Fund. But when I did a search, IMF specifically comes up from November 20th, 2021, because it says specifically implementing a CBC and there's challenges. Again, back to Augustine Carstens, recognizing these challenges, all the way back to 2004 when he wasn't even in the BIS or with the BIS, he was with the IMF. Because, again, look what it says from Martin Heiger. His interoperability breaks down the wall gardens of silo payment systems, giving customers business cycle or businesses choice, speed, and access. But the paper explores the use of blockchain. Distributed ledger technologies operating in a semi-decentralized way defined by the IMF, enabling what multi-ledger token solution. Um, hello, what would also be tied to that? Back to the beginning of the outline, maps, multi-apps, okay? So that aged well as well. Let's take it to a little bit more about this. This is from Ledger Insights once again. Why is this important? Because you see here from the citation of a platform tokenized for cross-border payments, it says additionally, there's the regulated liability network and it's initially proposed by the you know city group or city but it's been inspired by who the bis with its unified ledger with a report on the topic published at least then and one of the key differences is how it incorporates digital assets into the same network but there are significant overlaps i don't know maybe also like overlays or how about this an overledger that's blockchain agnostic don't get it twisted listen to this IMF proposes DLT, DeFi-inspired alternative to cross-border CBDC. Yeah, when was that published? 2022. You can read on more about that. I don't want to get into the weeds about that. But again, that age as well because it adds up to what Augustine Karsten pitched in 2004 long before blockchain. Look at this. I believe this might be from Tokenizer or somebody, so I do apologize. It's a good visualization. A prominent early experience in the CBDC space was exploring the feasibility of this design was the Jasper Ubin experiment, a.k.a. Project Ubin, led by Bank of Canada and the MAS, okay? Monetary Authority of Singapore, if you wonder what that means. The design paper explains in detail a technical approach of an asset exchange protocol using hash time lock contracts called HTLC. Also, you know, describes, excuse me, cross-platform workflow, think about that, that participants need to follow to implement an atomic payment versus payment PVP transaction across the platforms. Not just one platform, platforms, plural. In the setup, payments on each platform are either simultaneously executed or collectively rolled back, ensuring transaction finality, yes, finality, and reducing counterparty risk. And what does this show? Literally, where the arrows point. API integration, service interoperability, you have quorum part of the mix, and it says in figure 13, asset exchange protocol between two CBDC platforms in Jasper Ubin project. And of course you see Corda, and it's just like, huh, again, even then, how do you say quant without saying quant? We already had R3 Corda confirm. We already had quant network through the overledger confirm for even the likes of what? Project Roslyn and some other ones that we recently connected to as well. But again, API integration and a service interoperability layer. That is the point and it always will be because even before earlier, I think I talked about escrow. Look at the visualization. You literally see it on Ubin platform and you even see it on the Jasper platform for BOC. Again, look more into that if you choose to do so. Here's another one that is also aging well. It says, with or without multi-CBDC ledger, the existence of different national networks managing different wholesale CBDC assets will necessitate inter-network transfers for cross-border payments and settlements cited by the BISCBP, whether directly between two wholesale CBDC networks or between wholesale CBDC network and multi-CBDC network transfer 
of currency assets is a problem for which SATP appears to be the most suitable solution. And of course, we know when it comes to SATP, you have quant connection because secure asset transfer protocol, how many citations, how much work have they done with them? Tons, because it dates back even to what, to the 80s when it comes to the Internet Engineering Task Force. Not quant at that time, obviously, but again, understanding the work even for like Gilbert Verdian, dating way, way back then with his work with the IETF. All right, a little bit more about this. I did citate Project Yubin. Look what it says, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. You know, think about this. Merrill Lynch is big time, you know, here in you know, United States, New York, and so on. You have BS, BS, excuse me, BCS, Information Systems, Credit Suisse, all these other ones, JP Moore, HSBC, Project of New Yubin is literally listed right there. The future is here. Project Yubin, distributed ledger, SGD on a distributed ledger, Monetary Authority of Singapore. That's worth pointing out. A little bit more about this. Look at this. Here's a video. I want you to hear this. How do you say quant without saying quant? Once again, listen to this lady. This is straight from the IMF, International Monetary Fund, uh, from Kristalina Georgieva. Managing Director of IMF News, Pragmatic Optimist Working to Improve People's Lives, Empower Women, and Create Greener and More Equitable Economies. Listen to what she has to say. Only 34 seconds. We'll come right back. There is a very rapid development, and it requires institutions like the IMF, like BIS, and BIS is doing a fantastic job to move quickly to prevent two things from happening. One, fragmentation. We need interoperability. And two, lack of regulation that means we are going to be, uh, you know, we would be where we are and we would be stuck with what we have and it may not be good for the international monetary system. So let's get into it. And I'm going to take you over to this. Here we go. IMF, the outline, what does it say? Now I talked about the whole thing of, you know, specifically the Finternet. Well, this gets good. It says, on this point, we like to observe the proliferating number of base networks. By the way, the citation is from IMF Digital Asset Platform Model. So base networks, everybody. Numerous banks have launched their own digital asset platforms underpinned by separate blockchain networks plus there are several large-scale initiatives such as the unified ledger and the rln the regulatory liability network on the other end of the spectrum the access layer has attracted a lot of attention particularly from payment service providers there's an element of standardization such as qr code formats think about that because it says the access layer can build on standards developed at the asset and service layers such as Ethereum token ERC-20. How do you say quant without saying quant? Quant is an ERC-20 token, but it has access, right? And it has standards developed, right? And it goes over multiple layers, right? Absolutely. Check this out. This also ages really well. Let's take you over to the BIS because guess what? Back to the whole thing of my concept of the, the Finternet and with the research through Augustin Carstens, he states, setting up an innovation hub is important. And again, this is from BIS.org if you want to look it up. Setting up an innovation hub is an important milestone in Energy Central Bank's journey. Again, think about that, innovation hub. Bits General Manager Augustin Carson said, the word innovation is more than just a name. It's become a rallying cry for who? The central banks, basically speaking, around the world. Central banks exist in a world of rapid change. They have a duty to understand how technology is progressing and to respond to the changing needs of society. They have a duty to innovate and build technology themselves. But more importantly, back to the citation of how we tie in the internet and look what it says. In recent years, they've seen, excuse me, sorry about that, they have seen unprecedented innovation in financial technology. QR codes and mobile apps have made payments more efficient. Think about the Malcast QR code here in Meritius. I don't know where that's at, but it's okay. 
Better data access and analysis can improve processes around credit scoring. Again, th these are all things he gave in his pitch about the Fintech. Digitalized financial services are becoming more friendly, affordable, and accessible. And again, every single time we see some of these examples, it just pounds it home that much more because he even talks about AI and how artificial intelligence tools seem to have the potential to improve efficiencies and lower cost of payments lending and other financial sector activities. Does he reference anything that would hint ISO 222? Yes. He says, for example, many of the old, basically, the old financial transactions are slow, referring to obviously SWIFT, and many of them take days to settle. But old clearing, messaging, and settlement systems are a significant source of delays. Compliance with regulatory requirements can have manual steps and therefore be cumbersome adding to these delays but transactions are also costly and reflects on the lack of completion as well as manual and outdated processes and then he goes on to mention that with meritius they have a financial inclusion that stands at more than 90 percent but the gap is wider in other countries and he understands that they have to have a creative and you know a purpose an incentive to improve the system so what did they improve the system with? Well, think about it. Does this not add up? Tokenization is the context of money. Central banks need to address the expectations. And more importantly, is understanding that they already stepped up, of course, to work with a fast payment system. Of course, that allows for the funds to travel in real time. And it's just, I don't know if this flies past people's heads, but again, this pounds on the whole thing of the Finternet. All right. This might be the moment you've been waiting for. Because this gets good, in my opinion. You will see, plain as day, right here, some key things. And that is, like it says, let's take you over there, excuse me. This is from a PDF from BlackRock. BlackRock's investment engine delivers performance and customization at scale and innovative access to new markets. More importantly, like it says, BlackRock's ETF and index investing engine. Our investment engine enables performance and customization at scale. And more importantly, you know, some people may think that this is a stretch. But you can also got to like the font, the orange and the black. But our platform enables innovative access to new markets and growth opportunities. Bottom middle says tokenization as a new investment wrapper. Now, you may be thinking, I don't know where you're going with this. It's getting really good because before I take it to that key part, a while back in my deep dive, I talked about Aladdin. And what does it mention for Aladdin? They empower unique outcomes via our API-first approach across shared services and data. Aladdin Studio helps unlock data to uncover new insights, automated workflows, and accelerate innovation all on a single platform built for the pace of change. I don't know. Maybe through like a unified ledger. I don't know. Maybe through like a thing called the overledger that's blockchain agnostic. Yeah. Think about that for a second, which brings us back to this. Remember how I just talked about this part? Tokenization as a new investment wrapper. Hope you can see the highlights, bottom, middle. Take over to here, and what do you also see? Here is your boil it, mash it, stick it, and stew moment. Overledger provides a wrapper to make blockchains enterprise ready. Also, in that orange and black, whatever font, call it whatever, stretch. But, you know, all these things are definitely interesting, and it gets even that much better. How so? Listen to this. You want to see a video that pounds at home? This was published June 20th, 2023. The transition from traditional to digital. Patrick Campos of Securency, Future of Wealth. This comes from a citation of London Stock Exchange Group, the LSEG. Listen to this. Does he mention rapper? Well, you're going to have to listen. Here we go. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you. Thanks, Jamie. Great to be here. Uh, so, Patrick, why don't we start with, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, well, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for uh, Securency. Securency is a uh, blockchain-based digital assets infrastructure company, uh, really focused on 
uh, bringing blockchain technology to the traditional uh, world of securities and 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 really traditional assets, um, leveraging the power of blockchain and, and focused on uh, really a compliance framework to streamline the movement of value. Now we're talking um, a lot at the moment about wealth management and in particular digital assets and how they're going to feature in portfolios going forward. What do you feel are like the greatest hurdles for people in terms of adopting digital assets? Yeah, well, so I think that, you know, when we talk about digital assets and again, focusing on um, a digital wrapper around assets that wealth managers and investors are used to seeing today, but a digital wrapper that streamlines things. Um, and so, you know, my prediction is, of course, that everything is going to be moved to this wrapper um, within the next decade. Um, but great question on, on, on hurdles and obstacles. I think um, number one, um, there's a discourse in the marketplace that sort of falls on two sides. You're either, you know, completely um, anarchistic and in favor of uh, decentralization, or you say, oh, well, this, De this DeFi stuff is never going to work and it's all going to be, you know, traditional finance. And this, this is just kind of a gimmick. The answer as usually happens, lies in the middle. So I think balance is one. And I think the second thing is, is really abstracting away uh, the complexity. And that means one, talking about the assets and the outcomes, as opposed to talking about the kind of more sort of detailed nuances of the technology itself, um, which removes a lot of the fear and a lot of the uncertainty. Um, you know, I like to say, um, some folks never thought that grandma would give up her checkbook and yet here she is with online banking. Mm. Um, and that's because it was simple on the front end, right? And so um, that's the second part of it is abstracting away the complexity of using these assets. Um, and um, so it, it's those two things I think that will spur adoption. All right, so there's a lot more to it than just that, but how many times do you mention rapper, digital rapper? Those examples I thought really, really pounded things home. A little bit more about this. Let's take you to this part, because guess what? A discovery from Quant Papa. And that was some of you guys who are thinking about staking, one of your biggest complaints is, you know, I realize that Quant is going to retire me, change, you know, be life changing money, generational wealth, but I don't like the idea of getting hit with a great big, huge gas fee. Well, I've got some good news for you, because guess what? Not saying it's hundred percent certain, but you know how we talk about rappers. Well, here it is. Here's a screenshot. Shout out to Quant Papa. And basically, is this his discovery on Coinbase, and that is you have this quote unquote rapper QNT with the HTS Hashport Bridge QNT. Yeah, that's an example of a rapper and. Basically speaking, when you look more into that, well, if this ends up being a thing, that would be significant savings in regards to gas fees, would it not? Absolutely. I'd rather use Hedera than Ethereum. Just saying, not 100% certain, but that was something that caught his eye, and I thought I'd bring it to you guys. The other thing I want to jump into is this, because we did talk about this particular guy from Securency. Let's blow this up before we wrap things up. Why is this guy significant? Because just like you saw earlier, Patrick F. Campos is a strategic advisor, fintech specialist, philosopher, football coach, and so on. But more importantly, it's understanding that when you get more into the details of this guy, it shows here that he was the former chief strategy officer of Securency. And as we know, that's a leading developer, or he is a leading developer, I should say, of institutional grade blockchain based financial and regulatory technology. So when we talk about regulations earlier, this guy already gets it. He absolutely already gets it because, again, he was an advisor working on some of the most, of the world's most innovative companies in the Web3 digital space, payments, like you mentioned in the video, DeFi, gaming, AI, man. I mean, this guy has a robust background. And of course, there's this. Shout out to this lady, Papa Lola. Um, maybe that is an lady. I don't know. Guy, whatever. Sorry. Apologize. Wow. DLT agnostic does link got this functions. And again, I'm not trying to create tribalism here. This is his quote. I own Chainlink, but there's a lot of tribalism. I get it with QT. 
It says, does Link have its functions? Of course not, and never. This is DLT space, not crypto space. Overledger from Quant Network is DLT based with utility token cover by Mica. Mica, right? Then it citates uh, DTCC, security. We know DTCC with Nadine Chakar. And, of course, there's a piece about it, but I just want to get to some of the highlights because this is quite the deep dive. And what do you see? DTC, DTCC also plans to provide global leadership to foster industry-wide collaboration to help avoid fragmentation with different digital technologies and standards. DTCC says securities technology can address the issue by acting as a DLT agnostic harmonization layer. Boil it, mash it, stick in a stew, right? That promotes interoperability, liquidity, transparency, and security. So that's where it's basically at for me. All right. Let me give you a visualization because some of you guys were wondering, well, what does this have to do with, uh, you know, QNT being the most expensive token in history? Well, check this out for yourself because, you know what, this gets good. So basically speaking... Let's not even say $40 trillion like you saw earlier from, I'll pull up the example again. Yeah, from here, okay? Let's say, hypothetically speaking, well, lowball, let's say Larry Fink and all them, are, they're off, but have they ever really been off? Not really. When they say, make statements like this, it's pretty accurate. But let's say that BlackRock doesn't heat, uh, hit their estimate a 40 trillion assets by 2030. All right. Let's slow bottle a little bit. Let's say they hit it by 30 trillion. Okay. That's where I'm going with this. So, for example, you take that 30 trillion and let's say Quant only is able to do 1% of tokenization for the likes of BlackRock, which clearly we've seen these examples literally mention, you know, keywords like wrappers and stuff, right? So that would come out to be $300 billion. That's just off of only 1%. And again, lowballing it for even the likes of, you know, BlackRock. And again, this is just BlackRock. This doesn't count other ones out there like, you know, there's there's numerous, numerous other institutions, you know, State Street and, you know, I mean, we could go on and on and on, right? So been there, done that. So this is just BlackRock, okay? So 1%. 300 billion okay that's a lot of money do we have any examples that would even come close to that 300 billion well basically speaking if you go over here here's the example let's take you to here it would be actually ethereum at 278 billion dollar market cap okay now keep in mind for all the naysayers Ethereum has way more of a supply, and at the same time, Ethereum, you know, is basically, like I said, $278 billion market cap. Ethereum also had all-time highs of what? Let's just double-check that real quick. All-time highs, I believe it was close to four or 5,000, give or take. Well, we're going to pull that up just in case. Yeah. Almost 5,000. Three years ago, last bull run, 48.91. Okay, so bigger supply than quant. All right, and we've done the whole thing of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is basically, you know, circulating supply 19,752,681, but max supply is about 21 million. QNT is max supply 14.88 million tokens, and they have about 80% circulation, which brings us to this. Okay, a little bit more of that citation. You can see it plain as day. So with that said, let's take you to market cap of. And a lot of you guys have been here. So for this example, Q&T with the current price that it is at $71.12. With the market cap of Ethereum, we bring you to Quant being worth $19,257.67 which would be a 270.78x. And by the way, that would still put it at the most expensive token in history. And that's even lowballing it. Because, again, we're not counting other institutions. There's, there's other ones, obviously, other than just BlackRock. So add it up for yourself. And if you're still not convinced that QNT 
would not be the most expensive token in history, and you just think it's going to go to zero, well, the research would show otherwise. Absolutely would show otherwise. And that is where it basically is at for me. So if you listen to this outline, do me a favor and simply type in 19K, and I will know that you listen to the outline. If you appreciate coverage like this, like, comment, share with others. I really do appreciate you guys listening to some of these deep dives. I know they're quite the deep dive. So may you all have a blessed rest of your day. We'll see you on the next one. If managing your crypto feels like solving a puzzle, it's time to switch to Decent Wallet. Say goodbye to complicated setups and hello to Decent Wallet, the hassle-free solution to your digital currency needs. With just a few taps, you can manage, track, and secure your crypto with unmatched ease. And here's the best part. Grab your Decent Wallet at a discounted price by using the referral link below. Don't miss out on making your crypto experience smoother and more secure.